would have been classified as an African uh, French Creole. My father came here from Sicily in 1906. My brother, who was the first born of the New World to my father, he could be classified as an Italian Creole. Between 1884 and 1924, there was over 80,000 Italians coming through the port of New Orleans. The ones that came here, they came here to work the uh, sugarcane fields. Today, uh, there's a lot of Sicilians and Independents, and they meet in Louisiana. And uh, the French Quarter, for many, many years, was controlled by Italians. So much they even thought about changing the name from the French Quarter to the Italian Quarter. Of an understanding as to what is that. Uh, the word Creole is historically complicated simply because depending upon what part of the world you're in or what part of history we're talking about, there's a lot of definitions that swirl around. Uh, the easiest way to discuss Creole in reference to this place is that Louisiana, before entering the United States, was Creole. Because what's happening is European families come to Louisiana to create a settlement, which usually doesn't mean we're discussing the French because they came with that purpose. But at the same time, Spanish families and German families come here. West African families were being brought to slavery, Native American families from Europe. All these people arrived in Louisiana and they suddenly find out we have hurricanes and mosquitoes. There's alligators back there. So people come to an environment that they realize they're not ready for. Ideas from all these cultures and different people began to blend together because of that so they could learn to live with a new environment. And once they figure out a way of life that works here, life is great for them. But culturally, you're not French. And you're not quite anything culture was something different. And eventually that blend is its own ethnicity and these people identify as being Creoles. So throughout your tour that means we'll discuss together this Creole family. We'll talk a lot of how they live their life, how they run their business, how the house was built. A lot of aspects of them being in Louisiana will show you a cultural blend that goes on. Specifically we'll end up talking a lot about a lady whose name is Laura. We do that not only because the house is called that though. We got really lucky with Laura as a person. When we started researching this property that was our main question. Who is Laura? A lot of our researchers even questioned if there ever was a woman named Laura, because they very well could like that name. But we did eventually find a baptismal record for a young lady born here who had the name Laura. But at least knowing she existed was a good step. So we used that to find out what else we could find. Having Laura's record, we could find her parents, and her grandparents, and her great grandparents. At this point, we realized how much blood was involved. A lot of documents from the 1800s are hard to find because of the fact there was a civil war going on, so lots of things were burned. But we ended up with a good start on this family. We used that to just see how far we could. At the point of great-grandparent, we need to find any more records from these people. We won't find it in the United States. We'll find it somewhere in Europe. We took a trip to France just to see what we might find. And we found out this family liked paperwork. <laughs> what was in France, the business records for the plantation, judicial records, a transfer of property, letters written by the family members. When we came back from that one research trip, we had 5,000 pages of information referencing this plantation. When that amount of information came to us at one time, our research team's response was basically, that's it. Because what else could possibly be out there? We started publishing at that point what we knew about this family, how lucky we were to know this. And eventually what occurred is a gentleman from St. Louis, Missouri read our publications, called us up and said, I know something about them you don't know. So that made us curious. We met that man in St. Louis and hands us a stack of papers that were written by a lady who was born here in 1861 whose name was Laura. So Laura, of Laura Plantation, just kind of showed up one day and basically handed us her memory. Because that stack of papers was her attempt to write stories for her children about her life, about her family members, about what it was like to be here with them. So a lot of what I'm actually going to tell you today is based on what Laura wrote about Laura Plantation. My name is Joey, by the way. I haven't actually said that to you, have I? I'm your guy. So if you have questions, let me know. I'm going to try and answer those for you throughout the tour. Uh, if you have cameras, we welcome photography on our grounds. Inside of the house, y'all, they don't allow videotaping of the tour, but if you do want to take pictures between stories, it's perfectly welcome. Uh, in fact, the only restriction we really do have on taking pictures is we ask everyone to do so as we go through the tour, because it's more than likely going to be a group behind us, and it's not really time to come back afterward. If you do have a cell phone, we ask everyone to turn down the volume on the cell phones. That's mainly due to the fact that I have a tendency to dance to ringtones, and that's just embarrassing and dangerous for everyone. So, <laughs> Other than that, we're going to head inside the house. So watch your step one more time. ...in the Creole culture, you're always with your parents. But at this point in Laura's life, she would be able to go somewhere else. Which means she's going to meet new people, she's going to make new friends. The biggest reason to go to that school in particular is the fact that they are teaching things at that school that they know a lot of people in Louisiana are not even interested in. But they're teaching it. And what Laura wants to learn, that she can learn out there, but not really learn here, is how to speak English effectively. 
Laura's father found out about that. Laura wants to communicate in English and not in French any longer. His response to his daughter is said to have been this. Laura, don't you love your mama and papa anymore? You're a French Creole. If you want to speak English, we Americans do that some more over there. Here's a fun fact of history. This event took place 75 years after we became part of the United States. <laughs> discussion, 7,000 square foot retirement home built on the property for Nanette. So she titles it, she calls it her maison de reprise, which roughly translates to me a house that takes something back, as if she's reclaiming her life. If you notice there's a brick line behind me that cuts the house in half, there used to be a porch there. That becomes important because when they started building this house, Nanette had a couple of odd requests for it. First of all, she wants her bedroom upstairs. Strange because this lady's in her mid-60s, she didn't have to climb stairs anymore. She's designing the house, but she wants to go up. She also requests they face the house in toward the property, not out toward the river. Most with me as we uh, as we move from room to room. These are our original owners, Jacques and Selena Ramon. They were both from very prominent French Creole families. The couple lived in the townhouse uh, there on Royal Street in the French Quarter. They went. Uh, they were married in 1834 at St. Louis Cathedral. Jacques was 34, Selena was only 18 when they were married, so you can see there was a big difference in their age, also in their interest as well, because she was born and raised in the French Quarter, and Selena was a socialite. She loved all the people. But the houses I mentioned did almost fall to ruin. 17 years of vacancy, a big hole in the roof, and uh, the rain started washing the plaster away. Hundreds and thousands of bats flew in the house and made a horrible mess. Cows just pushed their way right through the doors and decided to live here. They took refuge in this beautiful <laughs> home. They cracked and stained all the marble and even destroyed the little staircase that was behind the room we were just in. So after 17 years of basic abandonment, a gentleman by the name of Jefferson Davis Harden, admiring the trees here, wanted to try to revive the place and worked very, very diligently. Got all the animals out, patched the hole in the roof, and everything was going quite well. But then the United States Corps of Engineers show up and they wanted to cut his trees down. Now that was the thing he admired so the most. So he wasn't going to let him touch his trees. And he battled it out with them, spending his last dollar. He sued them in two, hard, uh, two long battles in court. And he was the victor. They didn't allow him. Uh, the Corps of Engineers to cut his trees as this was proven. They put a little sugar water with a little bit of poison. The opening in the bottom, the bugs would get inside there tasting that poison sugar. It worked. Yeah, they would die right next to your dinner plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she just kept it covered. And this piece was a design uh, from India. It was found tossed in the attic, a piece of leather strapped to it. You can see it has a pulley system with a cord. And they would have the servant boy tugging on the rope. His job was to gently sway this all the while their guests were here to keep them comfortable. In the warmer months, they might even have a bowl with a piece of ice or a huge ice sculpture for very formal occasions. That would cool the air. Now, you know, they didn't have any more ice here back then than we do today. But they were ice harvesters, and they would go up north collecting ice, wrapping in burlap, packing in hay and sawdust, and ship it here. It was revealed that Jacques spent $300 a week, about like $4,000 of your money for a piece of office. By Selena P. Lieberman, as you remember their portraits from the uh, Paula. Now, though this family enjoyed very much wealth and luxury, they also suffered very much grief and sadness. Disease was very prevalent here in the 1800s. There was no penicillin, and there were many deaths. And a family with the wealth of Ramones was no exception to that. They lost early on in their marriage two little children, little boys, George and Albert, dying two weeks apart from one another of yellow fever. This distressed Jean tremendously. I think he never really got over it, his two little boys dying so young. And he used to write to Selena every day, urging her to come back home, because you see, she was a city girl, and she never really came to love it out here in the country. She was staying from the great parent, the artist, the parent and daughter barrack, the great blue. Great like this. Right behind that white book. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. The ground right behind the boat, uh, about like three feet behind the boat. It's a boat bed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What'd you call it? Great blue. Great blue parent. 
But we grow 99% of our peppers in South and Central America where the weather is hot and humid all year round. Our peppers are collected, weighed, seasoned with salt from our mine, and then we grind them up into a mash. Our salt mine is said to be as deep as Mount Everest is high. We put them into white oak barrels that we buy from Jack Daniels. By law, Jack Daniels is only allowed to use their barrels once. So we buy them and we use them anywhere from three to a hundred years. We use them until they literally fall apart and then we break them up and sell them as wood chips in the country store for a barbecue. Once our mash is placed into the barrel, we seal it, drill a hole, and place salt on the top. It sits for three years. This allows the gas to escape and the salt will eventually become hard like cement. Y'all oh, will be able to see the bottles being processed and everything. We have a board that tells you what number bottle we on for the day. You can walk down to the museum, they have a barrel of mash, a barrel of the liquefied Tabasco, they have games, other educational things. We have almost every sample of Tabasco sauce down in the country store. We also have food on the wagon and tons of souvenirs. So y'all come down and see us. Y'all enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> More than 2,000 acres sitting atop a deposit of Not solid rock accent. salt, thought to be deeper than Mount Everest, is high. This is a place steeped in the rich 180-year history of the Marsh, Avery, and McElhenney families, and most popularly known as the birthplace of Tabasco brand pepper sauce. The Tabasco story originates here on Avery Island with its founder, Edmund McElhenney. Mr. McElhenney was originally a New Orleans banker by trade. He married Mary Eliza Avery and moved with her to her family's sugar plantation on Avery Island during the Civil War. The family was forced to abandon the island when Union troops invaded but returned in 1865 to recover the sugarcane fields and reorganize the island's salt mining business. It was at this time that Edmund McElhenney planted capsicum peppers in his vegetable garden and began to experiment with making a hot sauce from these peppers. The famous sauce Mr. McElhenney first produced commercially in 1868 is the same Tabasco brand pepper sauce that today is labeled in 21 languages and dialects, distributed in more than 110 countries and territories, and used by millions of people to spice up the world's cuisine. Did you know that Tabasco is the pepper sauce most people ask for by name? It is the pepper sauce used to create the bold new flavors that everyone is asking for today. Tabasco brand pepper sauce. Legend has it that those first hot peppers Mr. McElhenney used to fire up Tabasco sauce originated in Mexico or Central America. In 1888, the pepper was officially classified as the Tabasco pepper. Each year during the pepper harvest since that time, a member of the McElhenney family personally selects the best plants in the field. The pepper seeds from those select plants are treated and dried and stored for use the following year. The seeds are removed from storage near the first of the year and planted in a greenhouse. They will grow here until early spring when the last chance of frost has passed. At that point, only the prime seedlings are selected to be transplanted into the freshly cultivated fields. The plants that are grown on Avery Island make up only a portion of all the peppers used in Tabasco sauce. Avery Island seeds are sent to growers in Central and South America. Spreading out the agricultural operation minimizes the risk of loss from plant disease and insect infestation. As the new plants slowly develop, each branch is loaded with beautiful peppers, which change in color from green to yellow to orange, and finally to the classic bright red. It is this beautiful crimson color that is the sign of a perfectly ripened pepper. A member of the McElhenney family personally checks for color and juiciness and then approves the crop for harvest. Only an expert hand and experienced eye can distinguish between a ripe pepper 
and a perfectly ripe pepper. On Avery Island, the peppers are carefully picked by hand as soon as they ripen to that perfect shade of bright red. When in doubt, pickers can gauge the color by comparing it to a small wooden dowel called le petit baton rouge, or the little red stick, painted the exact color of a ripe pepper. Pickers gather in the afternoons to have their day's harvest weighed by a member of the McElhenney family. Then, in keeping with McElhenney tradition, the peppers must be processed the same day they are picked. The peppers are immediately loaded on the trucks and taken to the grinding station on Avery Island. Here, the peppers are ground, mixed with a small amount of salt from the island's own salt mine, and placed in white oak barrels like those used to age fine whiskey. Each barrel is capped with a wooden cover into which several holes have been drilled. A thick layer of salt from the Avery Island mine is placed on the cover. The barrels are marked, logged, and sent to the Avery Island mash warehouse. This pepper mash is aged for up to three long years to bring out the distinctive and consistent flavor that has made Tabasco the leading pepper sauce since 1868. There is not a lot of salt in the Tabasco pepper sauce recipe, but salt from the Avery Island salt mine plays an important role in the aging of the Tabasco pepper mash. During early aging, fermentation is active. The gases and juices escape through the holes. The salt cap prevents any outside air or impurities from seeping into the mash. When the fully aged pepper mash is approved by a member of the McElhenney family, it is then drained and blended with all natural high grain vinegar, pumped into wooden tanks and intermittently stirred for up to 28 days. Providing all conditions are met, the resulting sauce, worthy of the trademark Tabasco, is bottled and so labeled for distribution throughout America and around the world. Now you know how we make our famous Tabasco brand pepper sauce. But we want you to have the full experience of Avery Island. This is the Tabasco Country Store, where you can see the entire Tabasco family of flavors. Original Tabasco red pepper sauce, Tabasco green pepper sauce, Tabasco garlic pepper sauce, Tabasco habanero pepper sauce, and our newest flavor, Tabasco chipotle pepper sauce, are now all part of the Tabasco sauce family. But Tabasco is a bold and flavorful trend with more than just people's appetites. Take a look around. People are wearing Tabasco. 830 bucks. They will get scared. Look, there's some bottles right there. We're here. We have nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, it's only 2 o'clock. <laughs> States flowed into the region to get cheaper land and of course the way people always motivated to move to get more money and among those were the Weeks and the Conrads and they settled in the area and almost immediately the family as they became adults were in sugarcane business and <clears throat> it became continually profitable and scholars said it was an interesting business because of the combination of mechanization for the mill, so it was kind of industrial as well as agricultural. And then the film will go into more detail about the Weeks family <coughs> and the various generations who owned the house. You'll hear actors reading from the Weeks family papers. And um, as I said, it's a large collection of documents with the largest 
portion of those prior to the Civil War. Once you go over to the shadows, about 85% of the objects belong to the family and when Weeks Hall bequeathed it to the National Trust in 1958. So you get to both hear and see what daily life was like in the 19th century prior to the Civil War. Miss Audrey's your guide and she'll be here before your film is done. Okay. <coughs> It's always, you know, if you have the subtitles, you're always tempted to look at them, right, instead of yeah. listening. Huh? It takes a moment of lead time for this. The Weeks family are to play an integral role in the history of the Tesh Valley surrounding New Iberia. Through four generations, their lives reflect the development of the Atacapa district of South Louisiana. Centuries before the building of the Shadows was begun by David and Mary Weeks in 1831, Native American tribal groups roamed freely. Among these are the Chittimacha and the Atacapa. But the arrival of white settlers has a profound effect, drastically altering native ways forever. By the early 1700s, a number of intrepid Frenchmen secure large land grants. One such is Louis André, who together with 231 Acadian refugees, establishes the post des Atacapas. These French immigrants must also make room for new neighbors, for in 1763, by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, France hands over to Spain all of Louisiana, west of the Mississippi, including the Teche Valley. Official action is taken to place Spanish citizens among the predominantly French population. The midwife for the birth of this plan is Don Francisco Bouligny. In 1779, Bouligny leads some 16 families from the province of Malaga, Spain, to Bayou Teche, christening the area Nueva Iberia. The Spanish influence in the Teche is short-lived. With the signing of the Treaty of San Il Defonso in 1800, Spain cedes the Mississippi Valley region back to France. Three years later, through the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, France sells the territories to the fledgling United States government. It is a land brimming with a vibrant cultural mix. Arriving at this juncture of rapid expansion is William Weeks, a weaver from Bristol, England. William first settles in the Felicianas near Baton Rouge to raise cotton at Bayou Sarah. He marries Rachel Hopkins Swayze, and in 1786, their son, David Weeks, builder of the shadows, is born. It is an era of rising entrepreneurship. In 1795, Etienne Boré successfully extracts sugar juice from Louisiana-grown cane. This achievement persuades cotton planters like William that the future lies in this new cash crop of white gold. With his son David at his side, William purchases 480 arpents of land for $300 in the great oak-covered salt dome of Grand Cote Island. It is the beginning of the Weeks sugarcane plantation, just 15 miles south of the burgeoning outpost of New Iberia at the headwaters of Bayou Teche. There are no more than six houses in Nova Iberia, but there are several good plantations in the vicinity. James Cathcart, Surveyor, Atacapa District, 1819. Life in the first half of the 19th century is challenging and precarious. David celebrates the New Year of Prosperity by marrying Mary Clara Conrad on December 31st, 1818. The young Mary finds difficulty coping in her isolated environment. I have nothing to read, and the weather is so gloomy that it gives me the horribles. Family members, especially Mary's older brother, Frederick Conrad, grow increasingly concerned over the failing health of Mary's husband, David. 
Mr. Weeks ought to change the air and the scene, and I am in great hopes that his island residence will prove beneficial to him. Despite bouts of ill health and bad weather, David, Mary, and the sugar crop prosper. We're all as busy as bees. We have got 47 hogsheads of beautiful sugar made and are not half done yet. Mary Weeks, 1820. Large families are also a valuable asset to the plantation economy. David and Mary named their second child and first son after David's father, William. Subsequently, Mary will give birth to six more children. Not all will survive. There has been so many interments in the churchyard that I grieve at the idea of the beloved remains of our little angel being left totally unguarded. Amid the loss, there are new beginnings. David lays plans for a new home in the village of New Iberia, more socially and geographically suited to his growing family than remote Grand Coat Island. The home place will one day be known as the Shadows on Bonitesh. As his classical revival home nears completion, David, accompanied by his brother-in-law Alfred Conrad, prepares for a sea voyage to New England, seeking a cure for his recurring illness. Mary, pregnant with their eighth child, remains behind supervising the move to the new house. We have moved into the new house that I find more cool and pleasant than I expected. I have all the children in it and open the doors and windows every night. I find myself often counting up the months before I may anticipate the joyful moment that I can again caress my ever dear husband. Merciful God that my best of husbands may be daily and hourly improving in his health. Mary C. Weeks, New Iberia, June 28, 1834. Dearest sister, he is gone. Your dear and good husband is no more. He expired an hour ago at half past three o'clock. Alfred Conrad, New Haven, Connecticut, August 25th, 1834. Mary emerges as the pivotal figure of the Weeks family history. The mother of six runs the new home on Marmitesh and sees to the care of some 300 enslaved people. An 1835 inventory of the estate provides a fleeting glimpse of the men, women, and children who work the fields, gardens, laundries, and kitchens. Many of the slaves are assigned to the growing and processing of the week's sugar crop on Grand Coat. On the island, the crop is very fine. The new buildings are covered in, mudded, and weatherboarded. The horse walk laid and the gangway completed, and Henry is making plow by a new pattern. Boyd Smith, agent, Grand Coat, 1834. In the seven years following David's death, Mary makes remarkable changes. A new sugar house, warehouse, smokehouse, and a new husband. Dearest Sister Fanny, Miss Moore came over here and said that she did not know which was courting the hardest. Mama or Judge Moore. On April 20th, 1841, Mary Clara Conrad Weeks marries Judge John Moore, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. In 1844, Mary appoints eldest son William, at the tender age of 19, as manager of the Weeks Sugar Plantation on Grand Coat Island. We finished boiling on the 19th, having made a little upwards of 600 hogsheads. The Negroes have holiday now. They deserve it, for they have had a long and tedious sugar making. The music hits a discordant note as disease strikes both crops and field hands. I have about 30 hands sick, and of the house servants, most are laid up, leaving none but Susan and Katie. I see now that we have been dancing too fast for the music, or rather that we have expended more than our receipts. A more pervasive illness falls over the land as divisive views tear the country apart. Civil war is imminent. Dear Mom, it is a serious matter to move a number of poor slaves without food or shelter. Carts loaded are passing all the time, saying that the Yankees are there, and here, I suppose, will be the fight or the scene of the action. Everything's in great confusion. Allie Weeks Mead, 1862. Dear Judge Moore, at Ma's request, I write to say the gunboats are within three miles of Butler Rose and that she is in great trouble as to what to do. 
and would be glad to hear from you. Alfred Weeks, December 1862. Mary's sister-in-law suggests taking the oath of allegiance to the United States. Mary's response is unequivocal. No, Hannah Jane, my husband and children shall never know that mortification. Mary seeks the safe return of her husband, Judge Moore. You wrote you were coming home. Everyone comes but you. I fear I may never see you again. Oh, Allie, it is terrible to be deprived of the love of one whose life has been devoted to our welfare and happiness. William Frederick Weeks, 1864. Upon Mary's death, family members looked to William to guide them through the aftermath of the Civil War. In times like the present, when every step is in the dark, I am very reluctant to take any more upon my shoulders. Despite his misgivings, William revives production at Grand Cote, signing a contract with the recently emancipated workers. Freed men and freed women agree to stay employed by William F. Weeks to gather corn, pull fodder, pick cotton, cut wood for 10 hours a day except Sunday. During sugar making to work 18 hours out of 24 with two hours for meals. Number one men to be paid $8 per month and provided with a house, good wholesome food, and higher wages for sugar making. William's perseverance keeps the family and the home place intact. Together with his wife, Mary Palfrey, and their two surviving daughters, Patty and Lily, William spends the remainder of his life at the shadows. Three months before his death in November of 1894, William receives joyous news from Lily's husband, Gilbert Hall. Lily's splendid son greets Grandpa with his first morning's welcome. He came last night with a lusty yell. The little fellow was fat and very vigorous. As the last in his line, Weeks Hall's early childhood at the Shadows is a solitary one. There were no other children, and it was an adult childhood. There was no money. There were chickens in the rear yard along the bayou, and no grass grew under the live oaks. The house was neglected, and the place seemed more ageless then, even than it does now. The preservation of this rare microcosm of domestic life in mid-19th century Louisiana becomes the overriding passion of Weeks Hall, grandson of William, and great-grandson of the original owners, Mary and David Weeks. I have from the first planned and intended that the shadows should remain one of the few perfectly restored examples of its period. It is not what has existed which is valuable to posterity, but that which, however humble, still exists. William Weeks Hall, 1940. On June 26, 1958, the National Trust for Historic Preservation accepts Weeks Hall's bequest of the shadows on the Tesh. Weeks Hall dies one day later, secure in the knowledge that the legacy of the shadows will live on. of original clothing and other items that belong to the family. As y'all can see, they're all boxed and categorized in wrapping paper so they won't dry rot. So this is all the treasure that we hope to share with you all. The shadows is the jewel of the plantation homes. There's no other one like it. This basically ends the tour of the house, y'all. And we hope that we've yeah. not only taken you through, <laughs> but that we've helped you take a step back in time and given you a picture of the life that was lived here. Because this is Weeks Hall's legacy. In his writings, he wrote, anyone can see a house. I want them to know the life. And that's what we try to portray for you. And I certainly enjoy taking y'all through. When you get home, please tell everyone you know they need to come visit us. And we hope y'all come back and visit us often. We're going to be going down the back stairs now. They're very steep. I'm going to ask you to watch your step when we get down. I'm going to tell you the points of interest, and then I'm going to leave you on the ground. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I got it. Put your hand in it now. Let me get a picture of it. It takes a while to read the point. It's done. Oh, yeah. All right, go ahead.
put your hand in it. Oh yeah, it messes it up. To make a shirt or a pair of pants, a couple of yards of fabric, it would take about a year. Oh, I guess. So it's time consuming. It's not I'd very rather, difficult. I'd rather go to Walmart. <laughs> oh, but it won't last as long, I promise you that much. And with this, I should get two or three yards of thread. Come in. I'll put the two ends together. It's going to fall off the spindle. When it's falling, all it does is twist. As it's twisting, it goes through my fingers and makes the thread. I'll do it slower. Everybody does that. The thread is very sturdy. So, and then I roll it on. So, okay, the next one, it, all it's going to do is fall off. See where it's falling? Yeah. Now, through my fingers, I'll let the fibers run. So you're just thinning out right. the uh, yes. thread. Yes. And then, like, right now, I'll just stop it from coming out and I just pull it, and that's the tension of it. And the amount of fiber I let go determines my size of the thread. Right. Oh. It's a knack to it. <laughs> it took me a year and a half to learn. Okay. Wow. And if I wanted to dye it, I'd dye the thread and bring it to the loom and make the fabric. The balls in the basket took about 50 hours to make each one, and I need six to make a shirt. So I make towels. <laughs> Shirts are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just longer now. And I'm not a happy camper when I'm hot. And then the clothes, all this clothes, it ain't gonna have on. <laughs> so y'all went on a swamp tour yet? Pardon? Y'all went on a San Diego. San Diego.